Hello, Internet viewers. I'm the Fairly Odd Gamer. As I mentioned in the last video, we're moving on to some of the mainstream 3D Mario games. Except for Super Mario 64 because... Yeah. So because of this, we're going to head on straight to Mario's first venture onto the GameCube, Super Mario Sunshine. Surf's up, dudes. Dude, that's my line. Oh, hey, Hux. We just started and already you've shown up. Did you guys know that Super Mario Sunshine is my favorite Mario game of all time? Huh. That's pretty interesting, actually. I myself am kind of torn on it. But hey, if you like it, more power to you. In fact, want to review it with us? Well, gamer, mind if I join you guys for the review? Yeah, sure. Why not? The more the merrier. Awesome! I'm getting excited just thinking about it! I'm sure you are, Hux. But before we get to the game itself, a little history. Even though Super Mario Sunshine was technically the second 3D Mario game to be released, it was not a launch title for the GameCube, unlike its predecessor that was a launch title for the Nintendo 64. But don't worry, we still had Luigi's Mansion as a launch title for the GameCube in Japan. In the comments section right now, should I review Luigi's Mansion for Marchio or Scary Odd Gamer? I'll give you some time to pause the video and think about it. Nintendo had been kicking around ideas for a follow-up to Super Mario 64 for a while. One involved adding co-op play, another involved having a bunch of Marios on screen at once. Eventually, they settled on Super Mario Sunshine, an adventure that would see Mario travel outside the Mushroom Kingdom. Now even though I have the original GameCube version and a bit of experience from it, I won't be using this version for the review. Like my Super Mario 64 review, I'll once again be using the Super Mario 3D All-Stars port, which is currently delisted on the eShop, but it is still available on eBay and on Amazon for around $200. Thanks, Nintendo. That was... That was a great idea. So how does Super Mario Sunshine fare in comparison to Super Mario 64? Let's find out. Mario, along with Peach and new character Tellsworth, decided to take a vacation via Peach's jet to a tropical island getaway. To where, you may ask? Welcome to the sun-drenched tropical paradise of Isle Delfino. We're so pleased to welcome you to our beautiful home. Peach notices a dark shadow resembling Mario in the video, but Mario and Toadsworth are too distracted by the prospects of fun in the sun and delicious Delfino cuisine to really care. As the plane touches down, our heroes find Delfino airstrip covered in some strange paint-like goop. What, did the Inklings come through here? Only the time traveled to 13 years ago. And before I forget, most of the Aldofino residents are creatures called piñatas, with squidward-like noses and leaves for skirts and hair. Apparently they all blame Mario for the incident. Okay, hold on. How could this be Mario's fault when he literally just got here? Mario, quite randomly the more I think about it, finds a water pump called Flood to help him clean up the airstrip. And what is Flood, you may ask? A flash liquidizer ultra-dousing device. And a cutscene literally explains the basic controls for Flood. Now, a short comparison. The GameCube version states what button does what, while the 3D All-Stars port cuts out almost all the buttons in use, even though it uses a different controller. Good thing this game has subtitles. There was a major change to Flood's controls in the 3D All-Stars version. In the GameCube original, the L and R triggers were analog, and therefore capable of pressure-sensitive controls, basically meaning that how much water you sprayed and how powerful it was would depend on how much you held down the trigger. Holding it down all the way would even lock you in place for more precise spraying. In the 3D All-Stars port, this wasn't really possible, so they made spraying in place and spraying while running two separate buttons. This is gonna screw with your muscle memory if you grew up with the original, but it's not the hardest thing in the world to get used to. But you can still adjust your controls via the game options menu to your preferred desire. Spraying the giant goop pile awakens a gatekeeper, or a proto-piranha plant however it's called, which is a giant piranha plant covered entirely in goop that can be weakened by spraying water into its mouth. Doing that three times removes the goop, resulting in not only the terrain getting back to normal, but also comes out a long lost cousin of the Super Mario 64 Power Star. More on that in a bit. After collecting the shiny thing, Mario is promptly arrested by the police. Thank you, Mario! But Bowser's in another jail cell! It's here that the Pianta prosecutor explains that the shiny thing Mario collected at the airstrip was a shine sprite. The shine sprites apparently sustain life itself on Isle Delfino and keep the sun shining. Because the island has been covered in goop, the shine sprites have fled and the island has gone dark. Is there an eclipse today or what? Who is responsible for this? Listen to this. Behold the sketch of the perpetrator based on eyewitness descriptions. The truth is obvious. The guilty party sits among us. Guilty! Ooh, I called it. Where's Phoenix right when you need him? I leave a boot to the head. A what? 
but Mario sends to clean the entire island and is not to leave until the job is done. Which is a pretty light sentence, if you ask me, for endangering their very way of life. Community service is getting off real easy. And remember, we'll be watching you, pal. We'll know if you start slacking off. It's pretty much the same as the last one, Delfino Airstrip, only it's brown. And defeating it not only raises the Pianta statue, but it also reveals an evil Mario doppelganger named Shadow Mario. Mr. Angry Eyes! Shadow Mario plays Bowser as he snatches Peach away as Mario tries to save her. Apparently the Piantas have absolutely no idea of telling who's who. They can clearly see that there are two Marios, one chasing after the other, and yet Mario is still tasked to clean up the entire island. <sighs> Look, I understand the developers were trying to do something different with Mario, but in all honesty, why should I even help these people in the first place? Don't worry guys, there's a perfectly logical explanation for all of this. Oh uh, yeah? What's that? <laughs> really? Nothing? Well, I didn't say I knew what it was. That doesn't help at all. And it's at this point where the game goes back to the Super Mario 64 formula in which Mario has to warp to different areas of the game via M-shaped painting portals. I'm sure that effect will be used in other later games. And first up, we have Bianco Hills. A first stage so epic, there's an entire channel made about it. Bianco Hills has you exploring a quaint little village full of piantas and traveling up to an old windmill. Mission 1, Road to the Big Windmill, simply has you defeat a gatekeeper to clear a path to the windmill. Then the next one, down with Petey Piranha, as you head to the top of the windmill to fight Petey Piranha. Not only is Petey Piranha another new character in the game, but he'd later be the first boss in the Subspace Emissary from Super Smash Bros. Brawl, so at least he's gained some recognition in the later years. In order to inflict damage onto Petey, you have to spray water into his mouth just as he's about to barf. Then you can grab him onto his belly button. Okay then. After collecting a handful of shine sprites, we find that the Delfino boathouse has been encased in black goop. Time for another gatekeeper! Unlike the previous ones, this one has two phases. It doesn't get any more challenging or anything, you just have to repeat the same process over again. The Fiend said Gatekeeper unlocks the next stage, Rico Harbor. It's like a construction site with gate climbing, returning from Super Mario World, and a boss fight against a giant blooper. He has to spray out the goo from his face and rip off the tentacles before trying to rip off his puck green mouth. Twice. Ew. Blooper surfing safari. Now I see why this is Huck's Gamer's favorite Mario game. Mario is literally surfing on multicolored bloopers. It's part of it, yeah, but it's not the main reason why I love this game so much. Oh yeah? And what's that? The overall look of the game is appealing to me. I love that this game takes place on a tropical island. As most of you know, the beach, in a way, feels like my home away from home. And to be honest, I think this game perfectly captures my ideal setting for a potential vacation. I completely agree. The game nails the atmosphere of a tropical vacation really well. It helps it stand out from the rest of the series and gives it its own identity. Plus it's just plain cool that you can see other stages in the backgrounds of each other. Actually you do bring up a good point. I actually like how each stage intertwines with one another as other stages can be seen in the background unlike in Super Mario 64. I know some people think the overall game looks oversaturated, but I don't think that's the case here. I just think this game looks better in my personal opinion. Our next stop is Gelato Beach. Right after saving the Delfino Lighthouse from a gatekeeper, thankfully for the final time. And the first mission has Mario spraying these dune buds to unearth a sandcastle, housing one of the game's many secret levels. And while we're at it, let's talk about these secret levels. Before starting these levels, you get a cutscene of Shadow Mario snatching Flood away from you. So these levels have you do what Mario is best known for, platforming. Although if you were to ask me, some of the platforming can be a bit finicky at times. I swear, there are times in which I would land on the platform only to find out that I missed it completely. Seriously, how is that even possible? Oh, and some of the platforms are literally sand. And what's it like, you may ask? Well, in the Hold up! I know what's next. <clears throat> in the words of Anakin Skywalker, It's coarse and rough and irritating. And it gets everywhere. I have mixed feelings on the secret levels. On the one hand, taking Flood away allows them to be a true test of skill and really get a grip of the game's outstanding play control. On the other hand, the level design can be a bit demanding at times. A lot of the time, I felt like I made a jump just out of pure luck. At least the triple jump and dive removers came back from Super Mario 64, and I think they make for great use in this game, especially with the secret levels. But in my opinion, the somersault is definitely the most useful throughout the entire game. Mission 2, Mirror Madness, Tilt, Slam, Bam, as you taking out these creatures called Plungelos, who have plungers for feet, unlike Larry Boy, who has plungers for ears. 
This is all to get a sleeping Wiggler off of the legendary Sandbird's incubator. Which results in Wiggler Ahoy, full steam ahead, a boss battle against a giant angry Wiggler as you literally use the sand dunes to knock off the Wiggler and ground pound it three times. Also, why does this sand dune look like the poop emoji? I think it's supposed to be a seashell. And at long last, the Sandbird is born. Platform on top of a top lane giant Sandbird going off a tower while also collecting 8 red coins. Another mechanic brought back from Super Mario 64. After that, we find ourselves in a foot race against Il Piantissimo. Think of him like this game's version of Koopa the Quick from Mario 64. And before you ask, no, it is never explained who this guy is. Well, after doing some research, Il Piantissimo is a human disguised as a Pianta. So wait, he's cosplaying as a Pianta? It's not a cosplay I take to a con, although I would love to cosplay as one of the many full-size Piantas from the game. On the other side of Delfino Plaza, we find a Bowser-shaped boat as Shadow Mario once again kidnaps Peach. By the way, that's the longest tongue I've ever seen. Gene Simmons, eat your heart out! That is Pina Island. The villain's secret hideout must be there. So Mario literally shoots himself out of a cannon to get to Pina Island, where we find the next stage, Pina Park. There, we chase Shadow Mario to a fountain where he unveils... What happened? Did the perpetrator get away? Mecha Bowser! The entire battle takes place on a roller coaster as Mario launches rockets at Mecha Bowser, dismantling it one piece at a time, while also diminishing its flame and destroying bullet bills coming towards you. Eventually, Mario defeats Mecha Bowser as we now discover who this Shadow Mario really is. Mickey Mouse! I should have known. Oh, darn it! This is what I get for being in the public domain! Why would you pretend to be Mario? I wanted to convince Nintendo to re-release my magnum opus, Epic Mickey! And they fell for it! <laughs> Please tell us this isn't true. Of course not! It was a visual joke! But I would have gotten away with it if it weren't for your meddling kid ults and your dog! You mean Pluto? We love Pluto! That's kind of you. Anyway, back to Main Street! That was gnarly, dude. You said it, Hux. Back to the game, Shadow Mario is actually Bowser's son, Bowser Jr., who Bowser has convinced that Princess Peach is his mother, so he's come to take her back from Mario. Leave my mama alone, you bad man. I won't let you take Mama Peach away. Mama? Mama Peach? I'm your mama? I don't want to know the reason behind that. Me neither. There are so many uncomfortable questions raised by that, let's just move on. The point is that Shadow Mario has yet again taken Princess Peach hostage and is now en route to Corona Mountain. And how do you unlock that stage you may ask? Oh, nothing really. Except you have to defeat Shadow Mario in all seven areas of the game. Yes, I said it. There are seven total stages in this game, eight of you include Corona Mountain. And I guess this is the point where we address the elephant in the room. There it is. Hi. The Shadow Mario missions always appear in Episode 7 in each stage, but in order to do that, you have to complete Episodes 1 through 6 in that order. Super Mario Sunshine is not as open-ended as Super Mario 64, because these objectives only appear by selecting that very mission. Also, I will give this game credit for having each episode help you point out the general direction you need to go, unlike Super Mario 64 in which you're sent to that world with no contacts at all. After completing the Wilted Sunflowers episode in Peanut Park, you then unlock Yoshi, but in order to do that, you have to chase down Shadow Mario again, this time holding a Yoshi egg. You hatch the egg by bringing a fruit to it. Like in Super Mario World, Mario can ride on Yoshi for, I believe, the first time in 3D. Yoshi can use his flutter jump from Yoshi's Island to make bigger jumps, use his tongue to eat enemies, and he can spray juice from his stomach to turn certain enemies into platforms. Okay. Only Yoshi can prevent wildfires. Unfortunately, if Yoshi touches water, he dies. Just poof. Gone. I don't know why, we clearly saw Yoshi swim in the other games. And it's not until after collecting more Shine Sprites, where he then unlock the other nozzles for Flood, being the Rocket and Turbo nozzles, once again by chasing down Shadow Mario. Actually, before we get to that, let's go back to Flood. In addition to his standard nozzle, its default secondary nozzle is the Hover Nozzle, allowing you to hover for a short period of time. In my honest opinion, I love the Hover Nozzle, and it's definitely the most useful. After making a high jump, I can always use the hover nozzle to either increase air time or to safely avoid obstacles as well as progressing through each area. As for the other nozzles, Rocket lets you launch up high in the air and Turbo lets you blast away at high speed. I often wonder if Mario using the Turbo nozzle on water makes you think of Dash from The Incredibles whenever he's running on water. 
but Flood only has room for two nozzles, and it's always the hover nozzle that gets replaced. If Flood had to get an upgrade by Professor E. Gad, then it would have been nice to have Flood gain access to all the nozzles, but that's just me. Using Yoshi to eat the pineapple stuck in the big red pipe gives us access to Stage 5, Serena Beach. In Mission 1, the Manta Storm, we find the beach covered in electric goop. The cause? This thing. And it turns out the Manta was at one point the Fry Guy from Super Mario Bros. 2 USA because Mario's Water Blast split the giant electrical Manta into smaller Mantas and will eventually chase after you. Also, I like how the music used for this episode is a haunting remix of the Gatekeeper boss fight music in this game. Fun fact, this mission is actually a reference to Stephen Kane's classic novel, The Shining. Apparently, Nintendo are horror fans themselves. After defeating the electrical Manta, the building covered in goop is actually... Hotel Delfino, but we just reviewed Hotel Mario! But this hotel has everything. Luxurious rooms, a hot tub, secret rooms inhabited by booze, being inside the roof, and even a casino. Just like another video game character, Mario also has a gambling problem. Why does it always have to be me every time? How should we know? Or in the case of King Boo down below, a boss battle against King Boo in the basement of the casino. Just throw a hot chili pepper on its long tongue and cool it down with another random fruit. Okay, seriously, what is it with this game and tongues? How should we know? And by making Mario gaze into the sun, literally, we then unlock another new stage being Noki Bay. And thankfully, it's the only area that has no piantas whatsoever. Instead, it's home to the Nokis, small creatures that have a shell for a body and hair. Noki Bay is my least favorite stage in the game. The platforming of the stage in particular seems really tricky to me. I felt like the game was demanding more precision than usual. In episode 1, Uncourt the Waterfall, you have to destroy a cannon controlled by a Monty Mall as it shoots down gook balls and bombs at a close range, which Mario can throw at the cannon in order to destroy it. Okay, was this Monty Mall raised by a ward in Super Mario Bros. 2 USA? But the downside is that the water itself still looks filthy. And what's the cause of all this? In Episode 5, Ely Mouse Dentist, Mario has to dive down into deep waters and find an eel with purple grime on its teeth. You know, gingivitis is the number one cause of all tooth decay. All you have to do is use the hover nozzle and spray water to cleanse each tooth. But here's the catch. You have the problem of an underwater life meter slowly decreasing every minute, but can still be replenished via coins. So what was the point of giving you an air helmet then? Well, if you didn't have it, then he'd probably lose most if not all of his underwater health in a matter of seconds. Oh, and before we forget, Mario can take a hit either from an enemy or a large height. He'll die after losing his health via the sun meter or falling into a bottomless abyss. And if you get a game over, then it's back to the hub world being Delfino Plaza. Using the rocket nozzle to get to the red pipe on top of the Shine Gate takes you to Stage 7, Pianta Village. Alongside a mission where you have to calm down some angry chain chomplets, there's the Goopy Inferno, the only main mission where you don't have Flood to help you. You have to venture past the Sea of Fiery Goop in order to retrieve Flood. And the goal of this mission is to clean up the entirety of the goop, right? WRONG! You actually have to make your way up to the Gold Mushroom and clean the Pianta covered in the fiery goop, and he'll reward you with a Shine Sprite. How confusing is that? But that's not the worst though. That honor goes to a mission that homes what we think is the worst secret mission of all time, Episode 5, Secret of the Village Underside. After using Yoshi to jump and hover from mushroom to mushroom, as well as clearing the waving flame, Mario jumps down where the secret stage has, get this, Chuckster Piantas. These Chucksters will toss you in the opposite direction they're facing immediately after you speak to them, so timing and placement is crucial here. Otherwise, you'll get tossed clean off the stage. While Pianta Village looks nicer in the day, I think it looks much better at night. Not only due to the color contrast, but I think Mario seems to pop out a bit more. So graphically, I think Super Mario Sunshine looks better than its 64 predecessor. As mentioned before, Super Mario Sunshine has 7 main stages, but fully completing the game requires 120 Shine Sprites, the same amount of Power Stars needed to fully complete Super Mario 64. There's 11 total Shine Sprites in each stage. Eight for completing the missions, two secret science sprites to obtain, and one more for collecting 100 coins like before. And somehow, they're handled even worse here. And now, we have to math. If you are the first science sprite in Delfino Airship, the amount of science sprites you can get from fully completing each stage is 78 science sprites. So try that from 120, and you get 42 unaccounted science sprites. And dare I mention the blue coins? Oddly enough, I was just about to get to that. In Super Mario 64, these blue coins were equal to 5 regular coins. Not that it made the 100 coin star missions from that game any better though. 
but in this game, they're actually currency. But what you may ask? Shine sprites! By earning the Bubble House slash Rika Harbor portal, two raccoons haul a shop in which you exchange 10 blue coins for one Shine Sprite. The total amount of blue coins in this game are actually double the amount of Shine Sprites needed for completion. 240 in total. Wait a minute, aren't the Shine Sprites supposed to be essential for sustaining life itself on Isle Delfino? You're right! Then how come Mario gets arrested and not these two? This game makes no logical sense! And with the blue coin shine sprite exchange, we can now subtract 24 shine sprites from the unaccounted 42. So in total, that is 18 shine sprites still unaccounted for. So how is that fully resolved? I'm glad you asked, Hux. Oh ho ho god. That's where Delfino Plaza comes in. Yep, the hub world itself actually has shine sprites to obtain, some of which involve you needing the proper flood nozzle to reach it, like the bells, the sand, and the shine gate itself, while others involve you completing obstacle courses and mini games that are, for the most part, extremely brutal. While you have the super slide and turbo track that are pretty easy, there was one mini game that I find to be the most challenging of all. Not the Lollipad one because I never got to it, it's this the dreaded Pachinko mini game. By jumping onto a bounce pad, Mario has to collect all eight red coins by landing on all five holes and obtain the shine sprite in a giant hole in the middle of the machine. Easy, right? No. Having to guide Mario in each of the holes is what makes it difficult even while using the hover nozzle, which I recommend using for this minigame. Furthermore, I recommend watching the strategy video on this minigame by Andrew Orders. He really knows the ins and outs about the clunky mechanics behind this minigame and what the proper strategies are to get to each hole. Wait, you managed to fully complete Super Mario Sunshine? <laughs> no. No? Why not? Because it's not worth it! Yeah, take a look at what you get for completing the game. Absolutely nothing. Well, that's bogus. You're telling us. Alright, let's just end this game already. Shadow Mario somehow floods the entirety of Delfino Plaza with boiling water, and Mario has to chase him down to Corona Mountain. And no, it's not what you're thinking of. Good call. Unlike the other stages, Corona Mountain is a straight shot. You just need to hop across these platforms with the right timing. The hard part is this stupid boat. In order to guide the boat, you have to spray in the opposite direction like you would with a motorboat. If at any point the boat runs into anything, the boat will immediately sink. And if you're not careful, it could result in a life loss. Finally, with the rocket nozzle, Mario can blast off of one cloud to another and eventually make it to a hot tub of... green slime? But Mario is here to save the day. You again? Mario! How dare you disturb my family vacation! How is it we never see Bowser until now, when the game is just about to end? Unlike the level preceding it, the battle against Bowser on the evil hot tub is actually quite easy. Just use the rocket nozzle to ground pound these platforms and you're golden. Similar to a certain science sprite you could obtain in a plaza. But doing that five times caused the hot tub to flip over letting out the final science sprite and everyone falls down into Delfino Plaza. Except for Peach using her parasol to safely descend herself. Mario and Peach see that the Shine Sprites have returned to the Shine Gate, but Flood appears to have been badly damaged. We then see Bowser having a frank talk with his son. Junior, I've got something difficult to tell you about Princess Peach. I know, she's not really my mama. Jeez, imagine that being part of the upcoming Super Mario Bros. anime movie sequel. But the Toes manage to repair Flood to its normal state as everyone finally gets to enjoy their vacation. Oh, and Neil Piantissimo finds the magic paintbrush on Gelato Beach. So, dude, what did you think of Super Mario Sunshine? Well, Hux, I just think it's based on how you want to play this game. Well, I mean, it's not bad. But I don't know if I'd really say it's my favorite, either. In a lot of ways, Super Mario Sunshine more than achieves what it sets out to do. The controls and overall game design are even better than Super Mario 64, in my opinion. That said, it's still got plenty of rough edges that are harder to ignore because of the mission structure. If the game didn't force you to play every single mission and gave you more leeway to play however you wanted, I think it would be a lot easier to see past the design problems, especially in those later stages. That said, I still really enjoy this game, words and all, but I totally understand why some fans dislike it. To add on to Shadow's last sentence, please do not intend on fully completing this game. With some of the bonus episodes being challenging as well as finding all the blue coins, or from what I've heard, it really isn't worth your time or effort. But if you're just playing the game normally, as in just trying to get to Corona Mountain, 
It's actually not a bad game. In some ways, I actually find this game to be better than Super Mario 64. Like I mentioned before, the game looks better. I love the overall aesthetics and having East Age intertwined with the hub world adds a nice touch to it. As for the overall gameplay, it's sort of a mixed bag. I really like having to use Flood as a game mechanic and I can have lots of fun while using it. But yeah, some of the platforming can be a bit finicky at times, especially with some of the secret stages. And before I forget, I absolutely adore this game's soundtrack and it is by far the most memorable for me. I really love the music used in Delfino Plaza and I also like the addition of bongos whenever you ride on Yoshi. Almost all of the stages use the same melody as Delfino Plaza but with a different musical style, which adds a bit of consistency. And let's not forget the oh so catchy acapella version of the original Super Mario theme as heard in the secret stages as well as the underground remix whenever you're in the underground pipes in Delfino Plaza. It's just that memorable. Overall, Super Mario Sunshine is a pretty good game. It's not a game I play continuously, but at least it's still tolerable. Give it a try when you get a chance. Well, at least I know now, never go for full completion. Nah, we'll save that for the next one. And what is the next game? That's for us to know and you to find out. Fair enough. Well, I should probably get going. I just hope there isn't any goop in my room. Anyway, later dudes! <laughs> Well, I guess we need to find a good Mario game to finish off the month with. Don't worry, I got something real good in store. At least I hope it is. I'm the Fairly Odd Gamer, and I wish you all good luck the rest of your day or night, wherever you are. Take care, everyone. Hey, be sure to support the channel on Patreon like Luke Jeffers, Scarlet the Hedgehog, and all these people listed next to me.